Hello everybody, I am Nick Pennsylvania, back with Brendan Bond, and our friend Brian is back with us yet again. The last time we were together, we had our friend Chris on, who just gave us, hit us hard and fast with a whole bunch of stories, predominantly about Fort Ligonier and the surrounding countryside, including a park in the area, and we we felt like we really need to take some time just to talk about that, because... There was it was just so exciting to hear Chris uh, with the passion he has for the history and the personal slash familial stories he was sharing with us. We really felt that we needed just to take some time where we could all discuss. And so we invited our friend Brian back to do that. So he's listened to the episode as well. Uh, but before we get to Chris's stories and kind of going back through that and having some back and forth and the impressions we've had, uh, we've had somebody write to us uh, talking about the John Binet. I'm going to pass it over to Brendan to talk about this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we had a listener by the name of Stephen uh, reach out, and he shared with me one of his own stories about the Jean Binet Tavern, who we had uh, was the subject of one of our episodes a few weeks back. And he had to sh- he had this story to share, and he did give me permission to share it on the podcast. And I just thought it was a really fun little story uh, that echoes a lot of the similar ones we've been hearing from other people about the Jean Benet Tavern. Uh, so here's the story as he has it written. The very historic inn has a restaurant in the basement, a bar on the ground level floor, and four rooms that serve as a bed and breakfast on the top floor. We were in town to attend a Christmas event at Old Bedford Village. When we returned from Old Bedford Village, we ate dinner in the basement, and my wife and children went to bed. I went up to the bar and had a few beers until closing at midnight and went back to my room and laid in bed. As I tried to fall asleep, I kept hearing a baby crying in what I thought was the next room behind ours. I finally drifted off to sleep, but woke up a couple hours later to the crying baby. Finally, I got back to sleep, only to wake again to the crying baby. (laughs) At last, it was sun up, and we had to get downstairs to get eat breakfast as it was served at a specific time, 9 a.m. I wanted to see the baby that kept me up all night, and there were only two other families there, and they were older couples. I asked the hostess where the family with the baby was, and she looked at me strangely. She said that all the guests were down for breakfast and that the room behind us had remained vacant for the evening. I told her that I had heard a crying baby all night, and she gave me a knowing look and said, yeah, that is pretty common. She told me to look at the guest book in the room. The B&B kept a book for guests to leave comments. There were nearly 100 entries in the book, and four or five of them mentioned being disturbed by a crying baby. I did hear some more research on the inn and discovered the Jean Benet Tavern is a well-known haunted location, and others had heard the crying baby, too, when no baby was present <coughs> in the inn. Uh, so that is Stephen's story. Me and him had a fun little back and forth talking about it for a while. So thank you again, Stephen, for writing in and sharing that story. I thought that was just a fascinating little story because though we didn't come across any baby crying stories whenever we were doing our initial research, uh, the fact that they're in these log books, I think is really, really telling because that's something you wouldn't mention unless it was like a problem, you know? And uh, as someone who, and I know, I'm sure you guys have done this too, when you stay a lot of places that have these log books, I love looking through them, you know? Like, it's just, it's really a fun thing to do. So I kind of I like- know there's a the- certain cabin that you and I have <laughs> stayed at a couple times and we've read the log book and we were shocked, shocked, I say, to see that our entry had been torn out. But uh, but as far as Stephen's story goes, you know, we do hear crying baby stuff often. And that was something that even Chris brought up with his, I believe, his grandmother hearing in the alley at her, around her home. Yeah, she did with was the cats. stray cats. No, no, yeah. it was, there were the stray cats in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And the children had been told her it was probably one of the child tales. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, that, okay. Those yes. were the cries of babies. Yes. But you hear baby crying stuff along with a lot of different paranormal uh, and ghost stories of like crying babies, but you also see it present in certain Bigfoot related stories, uh, a bunch of Fae 
related legends um and also just in general folklore you have stories of hearing babies crying in the woods and it leading people off to be lost or you know things of that nature and i think a lot of it's because whatever we're dealing with like whether this is a residual or a intelligent haunting in this case it knows two things it knows that a baby crying is something we immediately recognize and it's something that we're going to have a reaction to one way or the other whether it's going to be in this case just a simple annoyance whereas if you're out in the woods uh, a baby crying is a big problem because there shouldn't be a baby just crying in the woods and it kind of kickstarts some of our primal instincts when it comes to those kind of things to to protect and you know uh investigate further so yeah i just thought that was a really cool little story and especially since the hostess the next day sounded like she had heard that more than more than one time uh, i think that's kind of telling about the uh if four or five entries in that book were uh written about i wonder how many were not documented yeah, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think about that story, Brian? Well, I think uh, any time that you have either a child or a baby, I would agree with Brendan that it's really the baby is probably on a scale of 1 to 10. It's almost a 9 or 10. We're, we're conditioned as human beings to respond to that, at least any well-meaning, nurturing human being would. You know, there's a lot to be said about these homes that have manifestations of children, innocent children, presumably, cute children, babies, uh, and it, e even with hauntings where there's real children in the home and they'll say, I'm playing with this so-and-so who came to play with me. I, What I have, I guess, been more impressed with is that this, this is a not necessarily a casual or innocent uh, sound, it's something to elicit or lure the person into something and could quite possibly be a very negative uh, energy or entity. Uh, there's even been discussion that it could be a demonic and that they're masking. And I've even seen times when people uh, would hear their voice or hear somebody calling them that then they find out it's not really them. It was it was some something mimicking that person's voice. So I kind of always, and like Brennan says, that is extremely unusual to hear a baby in the woods. I mean, I guess in today's world, there's always those freak chances, but uh, I would sooner think that this is something to elicit uh, or get a person's guard down in a certain way or create a vulnerability in order for them to react. No, I completely agree, Brian. And you that hits on something that I wasn't even thinking about that uh, is one of my like big, like the things that really freak me out. One of those things is doppelgangers. Doppelganger stuff scares the hell out of me. And I don't know why that gets to me so much more than like anything else in the paranormal. It's the idea of something mimicking a human is just so unsettling because I, th I think the real reason why that stuff gets to me is because that has to have like some kind of malicious intent behind it and it gets rid of the residual element theories and it gets rid of the idea that um this is just like time and space not working well which is what i do think a lot of like ghosts and seeing the wrong person at the wrong time or those things can be explained by weird time things that we don't quite understand yet this is something using the world in a very unnatural way <laughs> you know when you have these things and it just really it really freaks me out I'm not gonna lie it really freaks me out well definitely want to thank yeah that was steve you said that sent that in brendan yes that was steven yes well definitely want to thank him because again that is a very interesting story uh, I'd be curious to go, because I have not eaten at the Jean Bonnet, although I have driven by it many a time. But when I do, and I will, I will see if I can't take a look at the logbook on top of that. Right. But yeah, we, we definitely enjoyed reading that, Brendan, reading that. And if you have a story, we would love for you to share that with us if you're comfortable doing so. Speaking of stories, though... Let's come back to Chris, who you would have heard in our previous episode. 
Chris had a lot of things to say. I feel like I'm going to say something, and I'm going to throw it to the two of you. But I feel like there were two themes that were kind of that go hand in glove. There was a theme of, uh, Chris made the comment of, is our reverence appreciated? And he felt that it was. So the themes to me were appreciation and reverence. And we spoke a lot, I know I did, I know Chris did, about reverence in particular of the material things that have been left behind and of the awareness of lives past and if there's an intelligence uh, do they appreciate our maintaining and the thoughts and how we are aware of their having been here with us i know we just finished the hearing steve's story about a child and i know brian when we were coming in earlier today you said that chris's initial story one of those family stories from when he himself was a, a young baby had you had some impressions about that and how about we open it up with that as chris did starting with that story and, and what were you thinking what were those impressions you had brian uh, i think the most uh, significant thing that i was impressed with chris's story in the early part of the podcast was the family lore story connected with the um, older, we're presuming older lady, but there was a, per, could be younger lady in perfume smell that had really alerted his mother. And obviously it was something out of the ordinary enough that that story continued to get repeated and discussed. And it was something that had imprinted upon him he would have known. The thing that, you know, in my own experience in my previous podcast that I had on the building that I used to work in was the fact that we had similar experiences. It was formerly a nursing home. We would pick up odors and sensations and noises and things that were very consistent with being in a nursing home. The first thing that hit my mind when he was telling that story, and he didn't really provide much in the line of background about the home or its history or the inhabitants, but it was really the stone tape theory that, that came to my mind. And I know that, Nick, you had relayed a very interesting impression about the smells within the woodwork uh, that can come from homes that have been around for a while and haven't been cleaned or uh, or whatnot. But for me, the stone tape theory, I think, explains a lot of what potentially could have been going on, absent of any other historical data that uh, Chris might have about the home. And he didn't really elaborate on that. And I don't really want to judge it. But it sounded like the whole, there was more to that story, and that he was a bit freaked out with the residence itself, but he did not elaborate. So, uh, maybe that's something you can come back to if you have him back on the podcast. Oh, we're we're definitely going to have him back uh, for a couple of reasons. One, he has so much more stories to share. I think he has a when you hear him just spouting out names and historical figures as well, it, it's really interesting. But you're right. I forgot because he did mention later on in our conversation about going back to the house and mowing the lawn and going inside but being too freaked out by it uh one other reason i will say uh we will definitely have him back and this is kind of a, a thank you to the people over at gateway china who in the immediate wake of the episode sent us a, a few mugs of fort ligonier one of which will be going to chris uh so thank you all of those uh, of those of you out there who are listening so but yeah just to comment on what what you were saying there brian when it comes to like these smells and everything, one of the elements that I think doesn't get talked about as much with um, it's kind of like, I think it goes right along with the stone tape theory that, that, that you mentioned that um, this is some sort of like, this is not an intelligent haunting, but it's something residual. Nick mentioned that it could be something that is very physical in the environment kind of coming out, literally coming out of the woodwork. You know, we think that we think of that a lot in old places, but that could really be any place, you know, whether it's new world. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot when it comes to uh, sense specifically is the idea that, because this is something that's happened to me a few times where I've been very sure about what I smelled somewhere and then you kind of like leave, come back, 
smell it again and it's you're like oh no that's actually this where your brain is mistaken i wonder is it not possible sometimes for people to have to basically smell something incorrectly have those synapses in your brain fire to the wrong thing and it triggered because we all know how uh, close smells are to memories and to other feelings like one thing for me like i'm someone who's who's a little on the paranoid side surprise everybody they always say with strokes it you smell burning toast when there's no burning toast when you have a stroke so anytime i smell burning toast like i make sure to like check you know kind of thing how are you living your life that anytime you smell burning toast because toast by definition is burnt right it is it's burnt. Like yeah, double it's double baked it's a it's a daily it's a daily issue. But what I'm trying to but what I'm kind of trying to get at is the idea that um, even if you smelled something like again, you might think it's floral, but actually it's you know something else, you know, or or vice versa, that triggers something in your brain. And like Brian said, because this is a family story, they probably don't have all of the details as far as like what about it really freaked his mother out that much like did she smell that smell associated with something and was just like you know parental panic mode where she was just like mm -hmm. my kid's in danger right now as a new mother you know like that's understandable you know but i just wonder in general when it comes to if our sight can be misled and if our sense of touch and all these other senses can be misled why not our sense of smell well, funny enough, I've been eager. I've had my finger raised because I have such a story for you. Uh, my wife actually listened to about half the episode thus far. And she was saying, you didn't talk about the strawberry story. And I said, because I am not aware of any such strawberry story. Basically, she said, well, in our old house, we were cleaning up in there. I was cleaning up in there, she said. And she goes, and I smelled strawberries. And I said, no, I talked about the smell at the house. She says, no, not not the house uh, 224, I think the house number was. She said, when we moved to our current city, we bought a, we bought a house and we lived there up until very recently, but less than two years ago. We had skeletonized a lot of it because uh, my friend and I were modernizing the electric. I mean, the house was built in 1911, had three generations of electric going through it. We had skeletonized a dining room because through there we could rewire most all of the second floor. In doing so, uh, she was cleaning up one morning and she smelled strawberries very strongly. And it freaked her out because this was in the immediate wake of finding a very old shoehorn that was uh, an actress model. I know you've seen this shoehorn before, Brendan. It was one of those uh, women's shoehorns where it was for tall boots. And so there was a hook so you could tighten your laces without having to bend all the way down and everything in your confining garments and whatnot. And she had also found in the wall like a very old rubber pacifier and you could tell it was rubber by the way that it decayed we still have these items but she found them in the walls she's smelling strawberries and she got very freaked out it turned out after all it turned of her out hunting, after all of her hunting it was the garbage was bags so that was emily's story and just a quick note we've been just plagued this evening by different technical issues. We're not exactly sure what's happened. I'm going to open up to a question uh, to the two of you. I'm going to, I'm going to open this. Uh, I'm going to put this your way first, Brian. Of all of the stories that Chris shared about the park, about the fort, about the surrounding uh, coal towns that he grew up in and his family had lived in, what was the wildest story as you heard it? That, that's a really hard question because all of Chris's stories were quite good. I think that um, he was going very fast through a lot of the different uh, venues, I'll say, grandparents' home, mom, mom's home, grandparents' home, um, the cemetery on the hill that was above his grandparents' home, the story of the uh, person on John Smith's grave uh, and so forth. I don't know. They were all very, I wasn't, 
I think the one that really struck me the most was uh, obviously I was very interested in the Ligonier stories. And I, I want to comment a little bit more about the reverence piece that you mentioned earlier about Fort Ligonier and, and just some of my experience, own experiences about reverence, showing reverence versus being disrespectful or being aggressive with entities. But I think the one that really struck me that I was visualizing as I was listening to it was the ones at grandparents' home and how grandpa had shared that, uh, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name, but he'll come down from upstairs and get you or whatever. And and <laughs> Chris remarking that he slept uh, in the corner of his grandparents' couch or on the floor or someplace so he could be away from there. I think, you know, I recall from my own childhood <clears throat> of staying over at my own grandparents' home uh, on weekends or whatnot, and they, it was an old farmhouse, very similar to this, and it had, um, you know, a dining room, living room, and they called it kind of a good room. It was more of a luxurious living area, and then there was one very narrow, very dark staircase that went up to the upstairs to the only bathroom in the house and i can remember it was the only there was no downstairs bathroom at that point it, you know at nighttime it was getting really dark on that landing to go up to that bathroom and you were in trouble and i swear that there was something not okay up there i don't know what it was it was never anything that adversely affected me but uh, his story really struck me and reminded me of how I used to have my own grandma say, okay, Brian, I will let, I, I will go up to the halfway up the stairs or we'll turn on the light in the bathroom, then I'll stay outside, you know, the hallway, and then we'll walk down together. <laughs> and I found myself visualizing my own experiences and how that was something that seemed to really play with his mind, even at this stage in his life. It, it, it's funny you say that that parting thought because you had even said about even though he was way too young to, re, to have any sort of memory of the smell story that he opened up with, the that the story had been told clearly stayed with him a very long time. So two to there really that that he's definitely carried with him into adulthood. Brendan, what did you think was just the wildest story? I mean, so Brent, Brian really connected with that one personally. There was two that like, um, okay, so, so I think the craziest story was definitely the Highlanders on top of Hill Ligonier yes. coming out of the mist and meeting with one of the reenactors and praying with them. Like and pushing, pushing him down, pushing him down, and, and then praying with. Like I was very reserved while while Chris was talking because in my head I'm just like, what? Like I wanted to just stop the interview right there and be like, hold, like no, 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 we need to talk about this one, and I can't wait to ask him about it because I'm not sure if there's any more to that story or not. But like, just given what we have to go off of, multiple full bodied apparitions, which is just bonkers to begin with and then you have them not being residual each each point of the story you're getting one step further into the rabbit hole and by the time we get to the ghosts making physical con ghosts of the highlanders making physical contact with the reenactors pushing them down onto one knee and then them all praying together we're past the mad hatters tea time we are past dante's inferno like we're completely down the rabbit hole at this point and i love it that is such a cool story that it's like let's say the guy telling it to him was being completely honest and com like let's let's again i'd rat like i've said this a thousand times where i'd rather believe yeah i guess, I guess oh, I he had that. he had to be very convincing because yeah that story was as you kind of put, laid it on it was so over the top that he had to be very convincing because Chris had multiple times said, one, that the reenactors, they like to tell tall tales, and two, mm -hmm. uh, that Chris hasn't always been so open to believing in a lot of this exactly and that's yeah, yeah exactly. had to be so, convincing yeah so yeah so the fact that it was it was at least good enough that chris felt the need to relay it you know and this is one of those things where it's like i almost like don't care if it happened 
or not. It's such a good story and it sets such a tone for the place. It checks all the boxes and it just like it get it gets your it gets your mind going and it puts you in that place and you just like just put yourself in that guy's shoes and imagine like that did happen. What a life-changing and like affirming event for this guy for for the guy and also the other ones who witnessed it kind of thing that that's something that's going to stick with me for a long time um you know what it reminded me of what's there's that? a very because i mean you both have heard stories of reenactors and i'm sure you both met some reenactors and mm -hmm. they they a lot of them will relay stories like this probably the well, the one that it reminded me the most of you both are well versed in different stories of gettysburg Stop me if you've heard this one before, but I used to buy all those Ghosts of Gettysburg books. I've probably got 40 by this time, but I honestly think they have at least seven. And I remember being a kid and reading about, I believe it was on Little Round Top, during the 100-some-odd-year reenactment. It was a very hot uh, day, much like the setting, and towards the end of the day, a soldier, another reenactor supposedly, had come up. The writer was commenting on, I couldn't believe he had like a really good kit. His reenactment regalia was very on point. And they talked about the day. And the guy handed him a couple rounds. And the writer wrote about how accurate they were. They were cased in beeswax. And all of this, it was the sort of over-the-top experience, not only meeting him, having physical interaction, having conversation, because that's another thing. Not all ghost cultures are they able to speak. And that story is the only story I remember to this day from reading those when I was a mm -hmm. little kid. And it shares all those same points whenever we talk about like you know something being believable or not when it comes to stories and again like i said i almost don't care with this kind of stuff if you're gonna make up a story boy do you have to have some confidence to make up that story but it's funny because like th the other one that stuck with me because again you'll you're gonna notice a pattern here was when he was talking about the grandparents house with the cemetery uh, up on the hill and like he's like painting this picture of how this looks with like the decrepit barns and the old chicken coop and everything and he had this off comment where he said and wouldn't you know it if some nights it didn't look like those graves were glowing again that was one of those things where i'm like like that literally gave me chills at the time when he said that it was again where it's one of those things where it's like he said yeah some of those graves do have physical candles that you know people put lights on but that's not glowing graves you know the idea of just graves glowing you know blue in the moonlight um again maybe not even paranormal but like man is that just a good it's a good scene setting you know it puts me in the place we talk so much about folklore on this podcast and, and, and everything we do we talk about folklore a lot and chris's ability to tell a story and put someone in a place and make people like us remember these stories is like precisely the generation of that folklore why i think it can be so so exciting those are my two crazy things and my soapbox rant for the day yeah i was very excited to hear you say the highlanders because that was of all the stories that was the one that i'm like that's that's a lot yeah i um certainly was pretty mesmerized by that as well but i kind of looked at the whole picture of what he was presenting about the different buildings, about the person who was of a paranormal, I guess a sensitive that came in there and was agitating the staff and, and so forth. The thing that really struck me is that that area and those areas that we're talking about all have a lot of energy. There's a lot of things that happened. These are uh, colonial times. The Indians were very prevalent in these areas. The Native Americans, I should say, were very um, <clears throat> prevalent. Um, it was the frontier. The life was very hard. There was a lot of death in these areas. There was a lot of suffering. So, and like Gettysburg, the reason I think that there's so many manifestations that are, you know, class A plus 
apparitions or intelligent hauntings is because the energy levels and the ambience and what happened and everything is able to create that ability to fuel those experiences uh, in general. And I think in terms of the buildings that he was referring to, I think what Brendan is referring to as well is that these individuals, we'll call them individuals, whether they were soldiers or enemies or, or they were part of America, they tell a story and they want their story told. Maybe they didn't complete their life the way that other people do, or they felt there was unfinished business. Uh, they want society or the, you know, the current environment of people to know that they existed, that they had something to count. So when you when he mentioned reverence, I think that's exactly the best way that you manage those types of experiences is with reverence, because otherwise it's going to be a malevolent experience, and you may really, you know, people may struggle with being able to, you know, handle those historical sites. I, I also think, too, it's entities will respond to things based upon whether they accept what has happened afterwards. Is the fort that's been constructed, is the environment around the fort, the recreations, is it something that they respect or see as something that they can relate to? Or is it a denigration to what they feel and think or remember and i think these are all things that i don't think chris had enough time to really expand upon but he was touching on it i, I was just extremely impressed with his depth of knowledge about the history of these places far beyond uh, most people yeah and i think that that grappling with how much of this is respecting the history and the people am i taking this too lightly is that must be a common thought among reenactors and people that work on these sites as well. Just since we brought up Gettysburg, I think one of the things that really puts into perspective the age of the fort, because one of the things, one of the factoids that Chris dropped that I was, I did not know that is the only fort in the United States where the Union Jack flies because it was never an American installation. It was decommissioned in 1766, I believe. So by the time of Gettysburg, like Fort Ligonier was already well over 100 years old, having been established in 1758. That says something to me. Yeah, how crazy is that when you think when you think about that in context? And you're right. I think that there is something to it being just like so many orders of operation older than what we're even used to thinking about as old, you know, around here. I think it definitely has something to do with it. And just to kind of piggyback on something you said, Brian, that I think is really important. Uh, when it comes to these places having like, you know, residual hauntings and intelligent hauntings and things like that, I think a lot of it too has to deal with what we bring to it and how we interact with it. If we are bringing positive intentions and then we're bringing, um, you can use the word reverence. I think that's a perfect word to use for, and just, just respect in general, those values, that intent, I think, uh, doesn't get lost in translation or culture, typically. And you would think that would be true throughout time as well. So then on the other side of things, if you have a location that, you know, generally disrespecting or not holding reverence or not respectful of the history and the energy that's there, I think you're right. I think that that that's a breeding ground then for, you know, if there are negative entities, then that's, you'd think that's what they would look for then the spectrum exists in the middle as well, I'm sure. But I think it's, it's interesting that so many stories that Chris had had to deal with both intelligent hauntings, but also residual. It makes me think that maybe in some places, the line between those two isn't as cut and dry as we think it is when we're normally trying to define something that is so hard to define to begin with. Again, this is just us kind of putting putting words on a phenomenon that we're just kind of barely barely grasping at. But that makes me wonder about because uh, you brought up the the Native American angle to this, and it makes me wonder what folks think of when they see 
like the amusement park that Chris worked at. That's something I don't have the cultural understanding to know if that would be seen as a as as disrespectful or not. I really don't know. If anyone out there has an opinion on that that's relevant, love to hear it. Because, you know, he was saying how uh again, he's so good at putting getting the vibe across of something when he was talking about hearing like the drums in the forest. Super spooky, just super spooky. Like it just, it that just, I really enjoyed listening to that because again, whether or not these guards heard that or not, like I felt like I could relate at least. Um, because we've all worked jobs where you've been somewhere, you know, probably late at night and just been like, hmm, it's a little creepy here. I wish I hadn't heard those stories, <laughs> you know. The Native American influence in that area. You know, based upon what I've read, there was a significant, significant interplay of that culture as colonial times was evolving to the West. And I have been at that amusement park. When you're there, you wouldn't really be impressed with there being anything, you know, unusual. It's, it is a, you know, typical amusement park. Uh, there's attractions, there's there's children that go to this park. There's teenagers. There's different things that are extremely typical. But yet the area surrounding that particular location, from my recollection when I was there, and it's been several years ago now, is extremely wooded. It's, it's very rural. The US 30, I believe, goes through there. And there is nothing around. I mean, it's very dark wooded area, you know, the population center from at least once you go through La Trobe and you go to the location, there's just nothing there. And I, I really think that in many cases, some of these experiences in those areas do have a Native American uh, influence. And there's things that we don't understand that could be explaining those things. I don't want to just I hope that it's not perceived as being negative. It's certainly not. But, uh, you know, the land, what is? what are the emotions tied to a piece of land and what occurred in that land? And for Native Americans, the land is almost everything. And there's a lot of things connected with that. And how do we, how do we make sense of that? It's, it, there's too many variables. And I don't think that we had enough time to really have Chris explain that. I think it was towards the end of the podcast. It's like, ah, oh, it's over with. You know, that's too bad. Uh, I would have wanted him to expand it. There's too many factors, you know, between you know the Native American culture, their they being so tied to the land, and you really need to have somebody who had a lot more knowledge of that explain it. But in so many of the stories that I've read, heard, seen, whatever, there's often an interplay between events, Native Americans or inhabitants, and then the, the current culture and what that current culture is doing to that land, whether there is that reverence towards it. So, uh, and, you know, you could go into different dimensions and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's like way advanced beyond what we're talking about here. Uh, how does that all connect? I don't know. I think you're reaching the same conclusion, Brendan. Yeah, I think it's definitely an ocean in the sense that there are things playing out today that have played out before at a big level. And by that, I mean, we talked about Fort Ligonier, which played a role during the seven years, aka French and Indian War, and it was decommissioned at the conclusion of that war. And we've talked about Gettysburg, a war that would enter into Pennsylvania 100 years after that fact. And there were wars hundreds of years before in that region. There were battles that were fought maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 years prior in that same area that we don't know about. And there was also festivities. And there were also moments of leisure and moments of pain and heartache and toil and moments vast swaths of sheer boredom and mediocrity and we are wherever we go we're walking through the shadows of 
all of human history. And if sentience is all that's needed to project such a shadow, then we are walking amongst the shadows of untold. I always say, you know, and I know you and I have talked about this, Brian, some of these towns we go through and I say, boy, if you could just have glasses on so that you could see what that looked like when that was first built, that house when it was first built and see you were looking at this dusty relic of a formerly grand thing. And that's just such a small snapshot of all the things that have been and happened there. I think that is absolutely the point is that all this stuff is cyclical. You know, you have to have the rise and fall to, to have a comeback around again. It's that, or it's that Ouroboros that we see so often. And um, I think that was very well said, Brian. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, comment real quick about <clears throat> one of the experiences that I can relate to from my previous podcast and those who maybe you're just new to the podcast, may want to uh, check out my last, and I don't know which number it is, but it's the one about the county building and, and various experiences. I have had similar experiences in that particular building, similar to what Chris was relaying about the park and the, and the Native American uh, ceremonies or, or noises uh, that, that was carrying on. So I know that there's something to that. The sound of my particular experience was a sound of a of a full cafeteria, and, and Nick, you know exactly which part of the building that is, where they served. There was a kitchen down in the basement, and then there was like an eating area, and then I think upstairs there was also a probably a social room, or whatnot. And I have experienced the same thing where you would hear like the roar of people, literally the roar of people. You're outside in your in your vehicle getting ready to leave at night. And I'm like, where is that coming from? It I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what, you know, is it residual? Is it intelligent? Is it a different uh, did they realize I left the building so now they could have their social time? I don't know. And and is it the same here at this park, you know, that the spirits know when the park is no longer being used, and so they decide that they're going to do what they need to do for themselves. How do we explain that? Is it cyclical? Is it dimensional? Is it just leftover something? Or is it, hey, this is what we do for fun when we're when we're entities and, you know, <laughs> uh, we carry on our lives. I don't know. You know, that's a, I've heard, Yeah, that's, hey, a, that's a really nice thought. I really like that, Brian. I like the idea <laughs> that it's, it's just literally cohabitation. They're waiting for us to get through like our shifts during the day. And they're like, okay, all these annoying people are out of here. Now we can like get back to, you know, living our lives and the spirits just go on with their business. And we see that as residual, you know, <laughs> we're like, oh yeah, maybe the same things over and over again. Like, look at what we're doing with the same things over and over again. I think that's a, that's a very, uh, like, if that's what is behind all of this, that puts a smile on my face. I hope that's what's happening. That, or maybe it's just things have gotten quiet enough for the echoes to reverberate. Very well said, Nick. Yes, very, very well, well said. said. Speaking well, of, of uh, I was gonna yeah. say, speaking of reverberations, if anyone out there has any thoughts on what we've talked about, any other any stories on things that we've already covered or things that uh, things that you would just like to share with us out of the blue, we would love to hear them. Uh, you can reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at the Ghost Furnace Podcast, or you can send us an email at the Ghost Furnace Podcast at gmail dot com. And Nick, you have and one more thing we for part us. Before we part ways, I do. Uh, what what episode number was Brian's Tales of the Building? Yes, so Brian's Tales of the Building were on episode 19. If those of you who haven't listened to that yet, that's a great episode. And then Brian's first appearance on this podcast was actually back on episode 8, which seems like forever ago with his uh, Thunderbird story that I still talk about to this day. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Again, thank you, thank Brian. You. Again, yeah, thank you, Brian, again, for uh, spending some time with us and putting up with our uh, 
our technical difficulties this evening. And again, for our listeners, this will not be the last time you hear Brian on this on this on this show as well. 